do my best not to tap this too much tonight. As mentioned, we're not going to have a formal opening statement tonight, so we're going to start with a broad introductory question, which is simply, why are you the right person to lead the City Council for the next four years? Uh, Kim, we're going to start with you. Well, thank you very much, and it's great, and it's an honor to be here tonight. Uh, I'm Kim Please. I've, I want to be your next City Council President. I have the business experience, the leadership skills, and the background to lead this city. Uh, I am a, a positive person. I love this community. I love the people that li live here. And I have so much to give. I am in, I'm willing to give the next four years of my life to this city to make it even better than it is right now. Because I, I don't recognize our, my city anymore. And I, um, I, I, I believe I have all the skills and the attitude to do whatever it takes to be your leader of the city council. Betsy? Thank you, and once again, thank you all for coming tonight. Yes, I'm Betsy Wilkerson, and I'm running for city council president. I'm running because I have the leadership skills, I'm a business owner, I serve on council, I'm a grandmother. I want Spokane to be more than what it is. And to do that, you need strong leadership. I have a long history of community service in Spokane, in various uh, areas of housing and nonprofits and philanthropy and business and mental health. I think all those things are needed to bring our city forward. I have the collaboration and the relationships to make that happen. I'd be happy to serve and I'll be ready to serve on day one. The city is currently working to address an approximately $20 million hole in the next year's budget. Uh, as a small part of addressing this issue, the Woodward administration has recommended raising property taxes next year and suggests that a larger property tax hike is necessary for the long-term health of city finances. Would you support raising property taxes, and do you have other proposals to make the budget sustainable? Betsy, we're going to start with you. Again, thank you. Yes, we do have a $20 million budget. How did we get there? A lot was unfunded overtime for our police and fire, glad to pay them for the work they do. We are looking at a structural difference. We are spending more than we are bringing in, and at some point something has to give. Do we cut services? Do we cut employees? That would not be my wish. There is property tax on the table, uh, property tax levy lit lift. If we want to continue down the road we're going, that's something we'll have to consider. At this point, to make sure our employees are paid fairly and you get the services you deserve, I would support that. Kim? Well, as a business owner in this community for 32 years, uh, the last thing I want to do as your city council president or um, leadership is to raise our taxes. We just went through two over two years of being shut down with COVID, my business was shut down. I lost 85% of my business, and there's still, we still have after effects. Um, our working families are struggling. Um, look, you know, I said the grocery store today, uh, uh, food costs are, have gone up and skyrocketed. So um, I do support, though, cutting. Um, all our families are cutting wherever they can. And so, you know, the last thing that I want to do is um, uh, raise taxes. I think what we all need to do is, I know our current city council, they've, you know, hired a bunch of people uh, after COVID. And, um, you know, I, I think when times are tough, that's the last thing you want to do is start hiring people. So. Kim, as a follow-up to that, cuts to the city council's uh, office budget, which totals around $2 million, would not be sufficient to salvage the, the gap that we're facing. Do you have any other proposals to finish filling that hole? Well, I can tell you what we're not going to cut is public safety. Um, I, that's my number one priority in Spokane because public safety affects every part of our community. It affects tourism, our parks, our housing, um, in every area. So that's one thing that I will not cut. But we've got to start incrementally, immediately. And I'm in, in my business, I went out every single day and, and tried to bring business into uh, my business so my employees would have work to do. Um, and so 
you know, this is where planning comes to um, into it, is that I'm a planner. I always plan three to five years down the road as our city council. You know, my opponent has been on the city council for three years, and it's just gotten worse and worse and worse, and their budget has increased by a million dollars in the last couple years, and that's uncalled for, in my opinion. Betsy, back to you. What do you think about proposals to cutting the city council office's budget? And do you have any other proposals? Well, first of all, the administration is supporting the levy measure uh, for a new jail. That is a tax. And they're looking at using some of that funds to fill the city coffers, um, the gap that's existing currently. We know that budgets are tight for everybody. That, that, that's a given. So if my opponent doesn't want to look at the potential of even raising taxes, then our city employees will suffer as well. We have some other ideas about low-hanging fruit, of uh, things that could, we could cut in the budget, but it will not be enough to fill that significant of a hole. Can I rebut that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I would like to say, you know, we have a housing shortage. We have a lot of people that want to move here, and we need to start building some homes and, and doing a better job at planning. And when people move here, that's, you know, more um, taxes that they're going to pay that will help us pay our bills. So I'm, we have to be proactive and figure out ways, other ways to, um, you know, raise money, so to speak. And I know how to pivot, and I know how to, how to raise money. Done all my life. Betsy, back to you. Why are you the best candidate to support the mission of the Spokane Police Department? Could you repeat that again? Sorry. Why are you the best candidate to support the mission of the Spokane Police Department? My record speaks for itself. I have funded and supported police since I came on council. We have funded cars, we have funded equipment, we've advocated and legislated uh, for the training center. All the things that they have requested and tools they have needed to keep them safe and effective on the job, council has supported. So there is this narrative that council doesn't support police. That's absolutely not true. If you read the paper today, Spokes and Review, uh, it said even the guild president says council supports the police. We have, and we will continue to do that. And I will continue to lobby for additional funds for our officers, things that we can't fund at the city level, and we could lobby the state level. I will be the first one in Olympia to do that. Kim? Well, I would definitely worry about that because I don't believe, I don't, I can tell you that um, she protested uh, having a police precinct in her own district that her district asked for and wanted. The mayor was very deliberate in getting that in there. And I've been in that community and talked to them. Um, you know, an email came out not too long ago about, you know, Betsy and our current city council president making fun of our, our police department and saying they'll grab a bat and do a better job than our officers. You know, what an insult to our police officers that risk their lives every single day for our community. I could go on and on. Her voting record does not support her statements just now. I have been endorsed by the Spokane Police Guild, despite the fact that, yes, she uh, did approve their contract, but they came out and they endorsed me because I am pro-police. I went on a police uh, ride-along and saw what those officers have to do on a daily basis. I know the police chief and his wife, Tracy, they are amazing people and care about our community, and I have their back. Betsy, would you like to rebut that? I, I would, thank you for that. So the police precinct in East Central, I just have to comment on that for one last time. There was already a precinct, police precinct in East Central. It wasn't something new. They relocated to the library without true community engagement. When the council members who represent that district didn't know they were moving, how was that outreach and engagement? And I am at the MLK Center and I can tell you from this summer, young kids of color still have issues with the precinct being across the parking lot. So we have to work Betsy, on engagement done. to make that happen. Thank you. 
Uh, spending on police overtime has ballooned in recent years, and police officials have argued that the primary action the city could take to reduce overtime spending is to aggressively recruit new officers. Both of you have said that you support recruiting new officers, but what would you do specifically to make it more attractive to work in Spokane as an officer? A couple ideas we've thought about is, in the old days, for old, older people, we had a fund if police officers bought housing within the city limits, we would help them with home ownership. That would be attractive to a new young officer going forward. Also, how, do we, how are we recruiting our officers? I've asked about homegrown. We have five colleges, universities right in our area. What does that look like? I know they go to Montana, they go to northern Idaho, they go to Oregon. But let's look within our city and at the state level uh, and through the Association of Washington Cities, we are also lobbying for funding and things we could do to make recruitment of officers across our state, not just the city of Spokane, but every city is being faced with these challenges as well. But home ownership, I think, would really be something that could be attractive to a new officer. Kim. Well, the first thing um, is our officers themselves. If they don't feel supported, why would they encourage other men and women to join our police force? Uh, during my ride along, I got to go to um, the, um, where the roll call. And I met, I said, can I take a couple minutes and talk to the other officers? And they were so, um, just, just upset about their own vehicles, and uh, you know, they're sh they're sharing cars. All their cars are antiquated, and so if I was a, a person and I wanted to join the police force, you look at the tools they have. All their vehicles are so antiquated; it's, it's frankly embarrassing. So that's one thing that we can do. Number one is um, get new vehicles for our officers and tools to help them. Let's talk about cars, mm -hmm. police cars. Let's talk about cars. Council has funded automobiles, vehicles for police officers. I have to let you know the former administration had not put in any funding for police vehicles. This council did. The money is there. It is a supply issue. We are looking across the country for vehicles for our police officers. They need dependable cars to show up when we need them. So if that's an issue, it's nothing council could do more than to give them the money to execute. That's on the side of the administration. Can, can I rebut that? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's the difference between my opponent and I. I'd pull out my Rolodex and I've done business uh, with Ford Fleet I would pick up the phone, and I found out from one of the council members that Ford keeps putting us down on the waiting list. And I tell you, I'd pick up the phone as your city council president and go, hey, remember me? I'm Kim Please. Well, now I'm the city council president, and I want you to add us. We're the second largest uh, city in this state. I want my cars for our police officers. That's what I will do. I have a mouth. <laughs> I'll use it. On the topic of police accountability, do you believe that the Office of the Police Ombudsman is currently sufficiently empowered to provide oversight for the police department? And specifically, do you support giving that office the authority to compel, invest, uh, compel interviews with officers during investigations? Absolutely, and I just have to quickly say, as a city council president, you cannot direct staff and you cannot pick up the phone and do contracts. I just want you to know that's how our city government is designed, the separation of powers. I would support an ombudsman. That's what the people voted for. That's what they have wanted. There have been barriers and obstacles to that. But our citizens want accountability, and we want it for everybody. We want it for the citizens, we want it for the officers, so we can all be safe. I think that is critical, and that office should be empowered to do what the citizens voted it to do. Kim. Well, I absolutely agree. Um, and every circumstance is different. And it, it you know, um, depending on the incident, absolutely. And I would support any um, investigations that would deem necessary for them to do that. Absolutely. The public requested that, and I support that. 
you know, we work for you, the people. Speaking of we, the people, here's an audience mm -hmm. question. Uh, with crime skyrocketing uh, over the last couple of years, specifically violent crime, what can you do better than your opponent to make Spokane safe? Can I go yeah. first? Yes. Enforce the laws, number one. Uh, our city council just, um, and our state legislature, uh, we just keeps taking the, you know, the laws and uh, loosening them and making them not uh, so stringent. So number one, enforce the laws. So as your city council president, um, th there are so many um, issues in our, our city with violent crime, and we just need to enforce our laws, bottom line. Well, the mayor just said crime was going down. So, yes, police can enforce the law. We could work with other organizations. There is this collaboration that needs to happen more between police and communities, because we could be a partnership in helping to police our own neighborhoods, but we have to feel like we are welcome to be a part of that. I think that would be something we could start imme immediately. I know the chief has gone to a community policing model. It hasn't been fully flushed out, but I would truly be in support of that. Can I, <laughs> sorry, can I rebut that? Go ahead. Well, um, I, I just want to let you know my opponent um, opposed po police patrols in our parks at night. I mean, that that's absolutely ridiculous. So I would support uh, laws that would allow um, our police officers to go into the parks at night and enforce encampments and you know so um, again it comes down to enforcing our laws. Betsy would you like 30 seconds? I, I would. There are laws on the books now that the police can enforce. Quickly I spoke at uh, Lewis and Clark last week to high school seniors in a civics class and they talked about parks and that made no sense to them that they couldn't go to the park after 10 o'clock at night. So we have to look at the entirety of it. There was a few parks that were having real challenges, but did we have to blanket the whole entire city for that? Our young people will be voting and we'll be hearing from them. So there are laws on the books, let's enforce those laws that we have. In the city of Spokane, money from tickets issued through red light and speeding cameras go into a dedicated pot called the Traffic Calming Fund. That money has traditionally been used for in infrastructure projects like stop signs, speed humps, things along these lines that increase uh, traffic and pedestrian safety. This year, the mayor has proposed dipping into that dedicated fund to instead cover gaps in the police department's budget. Do you support this? We're going to start with Betsy. I do not. That traffic calming money, those are from the red lights. Neighborhoods have been meeting over what they could do to make their neighborhoods safer, to help with cars speeding through their neighborhoods. And if it did happen, which I do not support, it's only one-time funding. Then what are we gonna do the next year? So we continue to take from traffic calming for which the neighborhoods have advocated for so much and then just fund the budget with that and not put in traffic safety in neighborhoods, that's not what the neighbors are telling me. They want people to slow down, and that's what that money is dedicated for. Well, that's why we need new leadership in our city council, especially the city council president. I do support community uh, policy, um, policing, and um, you know the mayor puts together the budget, and I feel you know, that is necessary at this time right now to use that money for um, what she um, indicated to put it. Because we're, we're on, under a shortfall. I have another audience question. Uh, the way that it was writ written originally is why no reduced speed near Dutch Jake's Park? More broadly, I want to ask, do you support reducing speed limits around city parks? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, this is actually going to Kim first. Okay. <laughs> can, can, I, I missed the last part of that. I'm sorry. Do you broadly support reducing speed limits around city parks? Absolutely. You know, um, the, the, without question. Betsy? I do as well. A, a personal tragedy. I had a nephew who was four years old by a park. He ran out to get the ball. Car was speeding. 
he was hit, and unfortunately he passed away. And so that has always stuck with me, where young children are playing, not just young children, but seniors and anyone, in a place that we have designed to be safe. Yes, I would support speed limit around parks. This region has a long history of dealing with hate, whether the MLK March uh, bomb threat, uh, the history of the Aryan nations in the region, and just recently we've seen a string of vandalization of LGBTQ symbols and organizations. What is the city's role in combating that hate? Betsy. Well, council has taken a position and put a resolution out. I think as leaders, we have to stand strong and bold that hate is not welcome in our city. We all belong. That is what the legislative body can do, along with supporting our police officers, again, to enforce the laws that are on the books. But we have to make Spokane safe for everybody. I also talked to some of my business friends. It's safety, but it's an economic issue. If we have incidents like they have had in our neighbors uh, in the state next door to us, do you know how long it would take for us to recover and how that would impact us economically? So all the good work we've been doing could blow up just on one bad incidence of hate in our community. Kim. Well, hate is, uh, you know, one of the most important roles, I think, as the city council president and as at the city council is, you know, hate is not welcome. You know, everybody is welcome in Spokane. Uh, and uh, you're, the, you know, the words and actions of the city council president and city leadership are so important. So you can either, you know, keep the peace or your words and actions will just polarize the, this community. So, um, you know, I would stand and do whatever it takes to, um, you know, denounce any sort of hate in this community. And I, I'm, I think it's absolutely the worst, just reading in the paper what's going on. The City Council recently voted to denounce Mayor Woodward for appearing alongside former state rep Matt Shea and self-described Christian nationalist Sean Foyt. Councilwoman Wilkerson was a co-sponsor in that resolution and faced criticism that the move was political and infringed on religious liberties. Uh, police, we're gonna be starting with you. Was this resolution appropriate? Absolutely not. The best thing that our leadership, this is again why we need new leadership, you know, running our city council. Um, it, it personally, it was a, in, in my opinion, and what I've heard from many others of you in the community, a waste of time. What, what it w should have been done is saying, you know, she apologized. Uh, the city council should have said, this is how you bring people together and say, you know, she apologized. Let, let's work on this together. Um, I, I never heard one word from the mayor that she even said anything in a positive manner about Matt Shea. Uh, and she truly, I've known the woman for four years. She was there for a prayer service. Take her at her word and let's move on. Because you, if you bring it up over and over and over again, all it does is just increase anger in people. We have so much going on in our community right now with our homeless and crime. I mean, I, I, I thought it was absolutely uncalled for. Betsy, why was this official statement by the council necessary? I think it was necessary. First of all, both my parents as ministers, and I was taught pray without ceasing, and I got some knee pads to prove that. But the mayor is always the mayor. She is the CEO of the city. Just as council president is council president everywhere I would go. So we represent the city. Since that incident, and I'm not drawing a correlation, but hate has gone up in our city since that incident with Matt Shea. When you represent one, you represent all. It was not against anybody praying but associations matter, and whether it's true or not, perceptions matter. That's the way we are in our society. I wish we could all get it right all the time, but perceptions are important. And as the CEO, she was in a place that did not give a good look for the city of Spokane. Can I read about that? Um, Betsy and Zach, 
Um, it's all about, um, you know, being right. And I, I think that um, they have, their words and their actions about this situation have made, um, the, you know, you talked about hate going up. It just angers more people. And what they, they should have said is, you know, people make mistakes. Let's forgive our mayor and move on and let's work, work this out together um, to show support and bring people together. Instead, you know, they have to bring her in front of the entire city, which is an embarrassment to, you know, us, to other cities. They're like, you know, I know other cities um, in Cam, our state. It's done. Sorry. Sorry, I apologize. Anne Marie, could I have Go ahead. seconds? Just 10 seconds. So it wasn't just about council members, opponent, and myself. There was a huge outcry from our community Council members Poe and I didn't just sit around and say, hey, let's write this resolution and try to embarrass the mayor or make it a campaign. We had letters from the faith community, from other nonprofits, from individuals who were upset about her actions. And political, who knew when it was going to happen? So it wasn't political. I didn't plan it. So it wasn't just us. Our community asked for what we delivered. Some council members and candidates have suggested that the city should wind down the Trent Resource and Assistance Center, the city-run 350-bed homeless shelter opened last summer, largely because of how expensive it is. Do you support closing it by the end of the next year? And if so, specifically, what would you replace it with? Betsy, yes. I can wait. So, the track. You know, we're talking a lot about the Regional Homeless Coalition. There is not enough money to continue to fund the track the way it is designed today. It runs about $9 million a year. We are looking at winding that down. Hopefully the regional homeless group uh, that's being talked about in our city, they would come up, step up, and take that over. They've talked about business support. They've talked about philanthropy support. We've talked about more state resources coming to the table. But it's a financial decision and a humanitarian decision. I cannot see people on the street, especially going into the winter. We are a compassionate society. I will work really hard to find money until there is a better solution. Well, our, the trench shelter is not sustainable. Like I said, you know, we have working families that don't get three meals a day. They serve three meals a day at the Trent shelter. Um, and, you know, winter is coming. So right now that's our only alternative. It, it's not um, uh, good that we, you know, take the convention center and, uh, you know, put homeless people in there. Um, they you know, they basically uh, put holes in the walls and, and ruined furniture and things like that, the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so right now, it's all we have, but maybe we can do cutbacks and serve two meals a day. Um, and, uh, but you know, we, I've also heard from some people on our city council that it's not homey enough. Well, you know, people are living on the street. It's, it's not the Davenport Hotel. They have a roof over their head and so. So it, the hominess, I just asked if there could be books at the track. When people are sitting in an open space all day long with nothing to do and services, it's not homey. Please, if you wanna go do a tour, call me, I will take you. It is four walls beds and mills that are brought in with one faucet that's attached where the hose is attached for water. So we're not making homelessness comfortable. We, again, are a compassionate community. Well, again, I just want to say that they have a roof over their head and it's, it's a place to be and to get something to eat. And um, there are porta potties, but you know, it, it, and again, um, it's better than being on the street. So we just have to, again, it comes down to new leadership and, um, and new solutions about working together with the mayor and the city council. 
to come up with different ideas of how we can do it differently. Do you support current plans to redesign Division Street in order to prioritize bus traffic, including by potentially reducing car lanes? This one's going to go to Kim. I, I do not support the road diet on division. Um, a, a waste of money, in my opinion. As soon as the north-south freeway um, opens, traffic will all, you know, automatically shift um, to uh, that to get from, you know, the north side all the way downtown. So um, I don't support it. I, I think it's a waste of money. Um, if you look at the current bu bus situation right now, our buses are empty. Uh, so to spend that kind of money, um, it, I, I think, is an injustice to our taxpayers. Betsy? I do support it. It is intertwined with the north-south corridor. They are built, they are funded and built in tandem to get people, when the north-south corridor is finished, to get people off division. Also, with that dedicated bus lane, it doesn't mean a car can't drive in it. So there's a real disconnect going on. And it will help with our environmental sustainability, carbon neutral. A lot of our young kids don't even want to drive a car. So we have to make transportation as convenient and as affordable as possible. And all the vacant buildings on the vision, look at how those could be redeveloped into economic centers or housing for our city. Look at other places across the state and you'll see it uh, all over the place. So I do support it. Again, I, 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 I do not approve of this. It's almost like they want us to give up our cars and ride the bus. I'm sorry, this community is not going to give up our cars. <laughs> that is not asking people to give up your cars. You still have a choice. So you can have a choice of a car, or you could have a choice of public transportation. Both should be equally available, and especially for the folks who cannot afford a vehicle, then we have to provide a way for them to get to work and play and socialize in our city. I'm not saying that we don't have excellent bus service here in Spokane, we do. Some residents in the Leita Valley are calling for a pause on new residential development because of concerns that roads and firefighting infrastructure are buckling under population growth. Do you support a moratorium, and can you pledge today that the needed infrastructure improvements will be completed by the end of your term? This is going to go to Betsy first. Interesting question. I just had a meeting with WashDOT today about this, and we talked about a moratorium. And the conversation is, this is Washdot talking to me. It's like, Betsy, if you do a moratorium, it takes all the attention off of the work you should be doing. He says the city of Spokane has been very conflicted about really the political will and capital to do the work that has been on the books for years. This is a can that's been kicked down the road. I believe that we have the political will with the right administration we can do the things, we can grow down there and we can make it safe and there's already a plan uh, on the books to start working on a fire station. That's the first thing because it's more than just transportation. It's the schools, it is a bus, it is a library, it's a fire station. So we have to be careful of how we want to approach that and it does take money to build. But there is other money, state and federal, that could help us do that work. Kim? Well, my opponent has been on the city council for three years. And those people up in the Leitaw Valley, up in Eagle Ridge, have been um, not served, in my opinion. And there should have been infrastructure in place. And that's what, where I'm different than my opponent. With my business experience, again, it comes down to planning. And you always plan down the road. You know, I've been endorsed by the Spokane Association of Realtors, the Spokane Home Builders Association. I have a long history in my family's in the real estate business. I understand infrastructure, housing, um, doing a moratorium does nothing. It take you know, she's kicked the can down the road for the last three years. 
I, uh, so I, I, I will do whatever I can. That's one of my first priorities is to look at the Leitaw Valley, get the developers, get the neighborhoods in the room and get it worked out because we have a housing shortage right now. There is a housing shortage, but the plan and design would have happened on the side of the administration. So again, our form of government, council cannot direct staff. I just wanna make that clear to everyone. We will partner, we will work, we will lobby for money, but that happens on the administrative side of the house. And the administrative side of the house has kicked the can down the road. We have to collaborate to get this work done. And it'll take strong leadership. Well, I, I think, <laughs> I don't think that's true because the city council approves, uh, you know, developments and developers put infrastructure in place. Uh, and, you know, you, you, here again, the blame stops today or the blame's going to stop the day that I get elected. I give you my word. Uh, it's just a blame game that people are tired of. Not my fault. I, that's got to end. Do you support proposals to create a safe legal place for the homeless who are living in their cars to park at night? If so, what should that look like? If not, where should these people go? Kim. Well, I do not support um, vehicles uh, in parking lots around uh, Spokane. In fact, I, I have a great big huge sign in my yard that says, not in my lot. Uh, so I, 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 I am not in support of that whatsoever. So the alternative, um, you know, uh, the, let's talk about the homeless situation again. You know, one of the things is last February, I worked at, at, I spent a, a several hours at the Homeless Coalition, a great um, organization where they, at the convention center, they have a day where the homeless could come in and get food and showers and haircuts and things like that. And uh, the one thing that they didn't have there was, you know, workforce training and companies there to give jobs um, uh, to people that are looking for work. You could get your warrant erased, but you can't, um, there was no place where you can sign up to, you know, get a job. Betsy? The big question for our city is where can people go? So I have the opportunity to visit Vancouver in another city over in the Seattle area that had RV parking uh, campsites for cars. It was run by a nonprofit. The gentleman I talked to goes, my RV is too old to be in a regular RV park. I didn't realize that. So he had his RV there. The services are there. It was maintained. It was a community. It's not going to go away just because we ignore it and don't want to deal with it. And again, with a lot of things we're talking about, if you don't want them here, where do you want people to be? Just pushed into the neighborhoods? We have got to have a real conversation about that. And it can't always be not in my backyard. Well, again, you know, we're talking about the trench shelter and there's, it's not sustainable. So you'd have to change zoning and everything in the city to allow that. And to me, that's just pu pushing out in the neighborhoods where it's just gonna cause more issues, more crime, more problems. Do you want that? Absolutely not. Betsy, I'm sorry to cut you off. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we're gonna have tonight for questions. We're going to end tonight's debate with closing statements. Uh, Kim, we're going to start with you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Kim Please. I want to be your next city council president. Again, I have the background, the education. Uh, I've learned over 32 years of owning a successful business in Spokane. I've, I've learned how to pivot. The difference between my opponent and I is every day I had to go to work. I went to work and figured it out. How to get work, earn the trust of people, my clients, pivot, constantly figure out, you know, uh, do the work, 
um, and then try to get paid for the work. I mean, um, my opponent gets a check, you know, every guaranteed check from the government every single month for her business. My business was shut down. I know, I know um, how to pivot, how to work. Um, this is a nonpartisan position, and I can tell you, I will be here for this community. I'm willing to spend the no next four years to make the city I love a better place. Betsy. The citizens of Spokane have a clear choice this year. Yes, I'm a small business owner too. Uh, oldest black owned business in Spokane since 1976, caring for people who are mentally ill. And we pivoted and survived through COVID as well. But the choice is experience leadership that listens, a leader who knows the job, a leader who knows the community, because I can find solutions that works for all, and I will work for anyone and show up in a leader who loves this city. I would be honored to have your vote. BetsyWilkerson.com. Thank you. Could I say one last thing? <laughs> Th that's it. I'm so sorry, Kim. Kim, Betsy, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you.